I, I can't really think of any good uh, recent bourbon news to kind of talk about. Ryan, do you know of anything? We could talk about how I got a bad batch to the Elmer. This podcast of The Bourbon Pursuit is sponsored by the folks at thewhiskeywash.com, a lifestyle website for people who always make sure they have whiskey in their life. Not because it gives them style, but because it gives them life. Thewhiskeywash.com. And we're back with another episode of the Bourbon Pursuit Podcast. My name is Kenny. And today we've got Ryan on the show. And Ryan, we're going to be talking about something that's not particularly just all about Kentucky. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to our next guest. They're down in Sarasota. They got an awesome festival going on. We have a, several festivals here, the Bourbon Fest. and We've, oh, we've, got, we've, got, <laughs> we've got Bourbon Festivals happen all the time. You know, we've we got, got Bourbon, bourbon Festivals cl- all the time. The Bourbon Classic. The Bourbon um, Classic. Everything that's, that's hosted by the folks that, that are happening over at the Bourbon Trail as well, the Kentucky Bourbon Affair. And then you've got a lot of other just kind of local events that are being sponsored by individual distilleries. Yeah, and, but what's cool about this one, it's in Florida. It's sunny and nice and beautiful which is not always the case here in Kentucky but they they're not only doing bourbon but they got a lot of whiskeys from you know Ireland Scotland they're doing also Japanese whiskey and so you're gonna cover the whole gamut of spirits you know in the whiskey industry I agree so today on the show we have Turner Moore Turner is the president of of Whiskey Obsession, and he has his own festival called the Whiskey Obsession Festival. Uh, Turner, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. We kick it off every single time asking people about how they either get into bourbon or whiskey. So let the listeners know what's your story. Well, I went to college in Virginia at a small private school called Hamden, Sydney. So you may or may not heard of. You know, being a Virginia school, we drank a fair amount of bourbon, and it was pretty much the bottom shelf plastic jug, you know, bourbon. Uh, but that uh, treated us well, and at that time, you know, of your life, it's more I think about quantity than quality. Uh, so I developed a interest in bourbon at that point. But then a few years after I graduated from college, I was introduced to some single malts by a couple friends. One was Oban, and one was Glenlivet, and. My interest really in whiskey in general was kind of ignited at that point with those single malts. I got really into scotches, and I started doing a lot of different tastings and events. And then after a period of time, someone asked me to do a tasting uh, back in Virginia at a private club. And they said, really, we have a bourbon crowd. So if you can focus on bourbon for this tasting, that would be great. And I said, absolutely, I'm happy to do that. And then I realized I really know nothing about bourbon. (laughs) So I spent six months doing intensive research and uh, probably went out and bought 25 or 30 different bottles of bourbon, you know, everything I could find. And uh, really, you know, I read some books, read some articles, and I really kind of came back to develop a new appreciation for this thing that I had been drinking 20 years before but knew nothing about. I guess, is there a certain bottle that you would favor towards uh, out of maybe those first 30 that you started with? Is there something that that really right. kind of stood out to you as something that was above the best? Well, the the bourbons that I drink now, um, I like Old Forester and I like Woodford. I like some small distillers. There's one out of Richmond called Reservoir, and they only make three products, and their bourbon is fantastic. I like that one a lot. In the American spirits world, I tend to find myself drinking more rye, though, than bourbon. So in the rye world, like Whistle Pig uh, has become one of my absolute favorites in the last year. Angel's Envy Rye is always good. Michter's. um, You know, fortunately, we've got choices now. You know, 10 years ago, there were not many ryes on the market, and today... You know, there's a much broader selection. I'm sure you're just like us where you get phone calls or you get text messages from friends and they're taking pictures and sending them to you and saying, should I buy this bottle or should I buy something else? (laughs) Yeah, I get that all the time or friends at a certain whiskey bar restaurant. You know, I've only got time for one or two more. We got to go. What what should I do? So talk about the the festival. Let's let's kind of talk about that a little bit. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I really kind of developed this interest and passion for whiskey in the mid-90s. And by the mid-2000s, I started to travel and go to different events and really kind of focus on it. So I started going to New York Whiskey Fest, Whiskey Live, the Whiskey Extravaganza. 
uh, which the Scott Malt, Scotch Malt Whiskey Society puts on. I've been to the Kentucky Bourbon Ball and gala events there. And after going to a few of these, I was always searching the internet for tastings and festivals and events here in Florida or even in Georgia. You know, Atlanta is an hour away by plane. So uh, I wasn't finding much. The Scotch Malt Whiskey Society event was really the only other major one in the state. And here in Sarasota, we have a number of wine festivals and craft beer festivals. So we've got uh, Wine, Women, and Shoes, and Forks and Corks, and the Florida Wine Auction. You know, these, these big events, and I thought, well, why don't we do a whiskey festival here in Sarasota? We seem to have a crowd that obviously likes wine and spirits, likes food. You know, it, it's, a, it's a high net worth community. The venue's called Michael's on East. They're a fine dining restaurant and a banquet center. They have an on-site wine cellar package shop. And I'd work with them on charity events over the years and said, hey, I kind of got this idea. Why don't we start planning for like a year and a half away? And the manager looked at me and said, oh, this is a great idea. Let's do it in six months. <laughs> it's kind of like, no like the present. Exactly. It's right. like any, any kind of project manager. It says like, oh, we can get this done in a year and a half. And they're like, well, you've got six months until you need to put this out the door. Right. So uh, I, I was really surprised that they were that enthusiastic uh, and that they thought we could pull it off. But, uh, you know, we started working on it. Our first event was April of 2013. I had 27 vendor tables and around 160 or 170 different uh, whiskeys. And we probably had 250 to 300 people. And so, now that's grown now, hasn't it? It has. It's, it's grown significantly. So, uh, and in fact, the event is six weeks from today. Uh, Thursday, uh, March 31st is our panel. Friday, April 1st is the main event. And this year we're going to have 52 vendor tables. So we've doubled that number. And uh, we'll have probably around 700 guests at the main event, which is getting close to capacity uh, with all those tables and and uh, whiskey ambassadors in the room and so forth. So I was watching, I, I guess you would call them maybe hype videos uh, on, yeah. the, on the website, right? You know, some of those things that really kind of get you get you in as sort of the trailer to to kind of see what's to come. Now, what do a lot of people that are coming there as, as a general audience, like what are they coming away with or what are they learning about uh, more at the end of the day and, and why do they really love coming to your event? Well, uh, you know, as, as I mentioned, I've been now to well over two dozen whiskey festivals across the country in Atlanta, Las Vegas, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, uh, New York, my, you know, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, on and on. And I've kind of taken some of the best elements of those other events and created something I think that's, uh, that really works very well. So this year we're going to have three events. Wednesday night is a dance party sponsored by, uh, Old Forester and uh, Brown Foreman, and that's just going to be a fun event to bring in a younger crowd. We've got kind of electronic musical guests there, and uh, his name is Brother Tiger. Uh, he's a nationally touring uh, musician, and, you know, so that'll just be a totally fun, low-stress dance party. The Thursday night panel is unique. It's a sit-down, three-hour class and interactive tasting with a flight of 16 whiskeys. They're 10 mil pours, so uh, they're, uh, you know, we, we are conscious of the amount of alcohol that we're serving in uh, three hours or so. But uh, those 16 whiskey samples are presented by four distillers and four ambassadors. And I've got people who fly in from D.C. and Rhode Island and come down from Georgia and come from the east coast of Florida and all over. And they, they absolutely love the panel because the knowledge that is exchanged there, but in a really fun and casual environment, uh, it's remarkable. They catch a one hell of a buzz, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> so another quick question about this panel is, is it more or less like people asking questions and kind of getting answers and insights in the industry, or is it more like a, 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 a master distiller or a brand ambassador that's leading you in a tasting and making sure you're smelling or tasting the notes that they are, he or she is trying to convey. Yep, it's both of those things. So the format is all eight panelists are up on the podium with me, and we arrange the 16 whiskeys from 
lighter flavors, obviously, to bolder and smoky flavors, uh, you know, so that your palate is maintained throughout the evening. And each panelist gets five or ten minutes to introduce him or herself, uh, the distillery, and whatever the first whiskey is. And usually, you know, they take five or six or seven minutes, and then we field a few questions from the audience, and then we move on. But what is great is the other panelists will ask questions of their colleagues up on stage. And there is a lot of banter back and forth and interaction. I got the idea for the panel from a couple places. New York Whiskey Fest a few years ago did what they called Whiskey Weekend. And the main event was Friday night, the grand tasting. And then Saturday morning, you sat in the ballroom and... You kept your seat, but all of the classes changed. The, the panelists throughout the day from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. changed, and there were different tastings and chocolate pairings, and uh, John Hansel spoke, and, you know, all these different things. And I thought that was really so valuable. You know, the, the grand tastings are great, and the master classes that are like half an hour that happen during those are great at a number of different events. But to be, you know, in, in a place where you're getting these essentially hours of education that are really in-depth, it's remarkable. And what struck me more than anything else, at one of these New York Whiskey Fest panels, there were representatives from half a dozen or more distilleries all up there sharing their stories and their products and talking. And professionally, I'm in investment management. And I was thinking, would you ever see the CEOs of Google, Microsoft, IBM, Apple and Cisco up there sharing the stage? And the answer is no, because it's a cutthroat business and they're all assuming each other. And you could never get them in the same room, much less genuinely complementing the innovations that each other are coming up with and the contributions to the industry. And it, it really is a, a special group of people. Although the spirits business is cutthroat at some level, it's a really human business. And these people interact well with each other. They, they complement each other. They are excited about the innovations that they're seeing. It's, it's really a neat thing to be a part of. Well, maybe you can, you can try to pay somebody to have like one Jerry Springer moment. So, <laughs> yeah. so it's like something they can always remember, right? <laughs> but uh, another question for you, you know, you kind of talked about a little bit. You said when somebody comes up and they say, we're going to do a tasting and we're kind of start with something that's very light then very mellow into something that's more bold or so, or more smoky or more flavorful. Kind of give us one example and I'll let you choose um, any one of the panelists and kind of like maybe some of the brands of, of how they would possibly uh, do their tasting if they have three or four different uh, whiskeys or bourbon that you're going to be doing when you're going through this uh, interactive panel. Okay, so I haven't quite finalized the uh, 16 whiskeys that we're going to be sampling. But, for example, we'll probably start off with Stranahan's Colorado Whiskey. And Rob Dietrich is their distiller, uh, so he makes it. He lives and breathes it every day. I love it. I think it's a phenomenal American whiskey. But it's light. It's, it's similar a little bit to, like, the Yamazaki 12 or uh, Red Breast, you know, Irish whiskey. It doesn't, it doesn't have tremendously bold flavors. It's complex. It's, you know, it, it's not super bold. So we'll start off with Stranahan's. Then uh, we'll probably do Glenn Morangy's new limited edition release, the Milshan. And if you know Glenn Morangy, obviously it's a very elegant, delicate single malt scotch. You know, so in that way we're kind of wading in, you know, to the de to, to the shallow end at first. Then we'll make our way through the Larceny bourbon. Uh, make where we have Makers Mark ca uh, 46 cask strength. Uh, this year. So that'll be kind of in the middle of the pack there. Makers 46 is a little lighter. It's obviously a no rye uh, mash bill, but it's cast strength. So it's going to be a little bit bolder. And then we'll get into high West boo rye, Elijah Craig, small batch, Michter's barrel strength, rye, uh, high West campfire, and ending up with uh, Ardbeg, the uh, Ardbeg, I think Perpetuum is what we're doing. What you're getting at is you're not just looking at 
a bunch of different bourbons, right? Is is I think it's great because you're sampling a bunch of different whiskeys. So even if somebody was, you know, maybe stubborn like me and is just like, oh, if it's and not, it, yeah, like if it's not bourbon, I don't want it, right? Uh, and the and what, hell, the hell of scotch. Yeah, right. But I mean, what this does is it gives you that opportunity to go and try a bunch of different things without saying like, okay, I need to go drop another two or three hundred dollars at the liquor store to be able to sample and try to figure out what what is it that I like. But not only that is you get an opportunity to learn from the ambassadors and the distillers at these different manufacturers kind of what they really see it and how you should be seeing it as well. And that you shouldn't be really comparing apples to oranges here, but you should really just um, kind of kind of take for each one for um, its uniqueness and, and what it is. Yeah, absolutely. People who've been to other events and been to my event have commented that they really like that range. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I went to the Kentucky Bourbon Ball in Bardstown a few years ago, and that was a fantastic event. And part of the reason I go is to uh, obviously sample these great, you know, whiskeys. I visited seven or eight distilleries all around Bardstown and, you know, some iconic names there. But uh, by the end of the night, I got to tell you, I was craving a good smoky single malt scotch because I could only drink so much bourbon all night. Especially for those people that have um, the the more depth of palates and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm sure having something to kind of mix it up is something they would enjoy as well. So let's move on into the Friday event. So talk about, and this is that you said is kind of like the main event, right? So kind of talk about the day and, and what's really happening from, from start to finish. Uh, and the last thing I'll say about the panel, uh, in the last few days, I've been out and about marketing locally and putting up posters and so forth, and I've run into a few people who work in the industry, either as distributors or bartenders and so forth, and they really love the panel because, one, they're working on Friday nights usually, but, two, it just gives them a whole other level of appreciation and depth of knowledge from the makers that uh, they wouldn't otherwise uh, have the chance to get. So it's, you know, it's not uh, just us whiskey geeks. It's, you know, the folks in the industry who are able to learn right along with the rest of us. And it's fun. So Friday's main event, the grand tasting, uh, will have 52 vendor tables. As I said, some of those are dedicated individual tables like Glenn Morangie and Art Bag have their own, and Johnny Walker has its own, and so forth. But then other ones are kind of a potpourri from the distributor. Uh, Republic National has dozens of great brands. So on one table, they'll have 1792 and E.H. Taylor and Buffalo Trace. Uh, some, some tables will be a mix. Like in that case, those were Sazerac products. In other cases, they're all you know, just showcasing one brand in particular. We're going to have around 24 or 25 principals, meaning an ambassador or a distiller present. And I have honestly only seen that kind of industry support in Las Vegas at the Nth Show, which is phenomenal. I think it's the best show in the country, uh, or in New York at Whiskey Live or Whiskey Fest. And all the other events I've been to uh, across the country, they're good events. I got a great range of whiskeys, but the industry doesn't come out uh, as much. And I think part of the reason is, Hey, you know, Florida in March isn't a bad place to be. <laughs> That's so, very true. Uh, and you know, like we were talking about Sarasota kind of sells itself. So, uh, uh, a lot of things are working in my favor. Yeah. And you uh, and got guess, March madness going on too. You can right. enjoy oh, whiskey, yeah. some sunshine and basketball. Yep, exactly. And you know, I know, you know, folks come in from out of town and out of state and they play golf or, you know, they take the kids to Bush Gardens and, you know, there's just plenty to do. So guests really enjoy being able to interact with those ambassadors and distillers. And to me, when I go to other events, that really is what makes it special because you get those little stories. You meet the people, you hear about what they're doing, you get gossip on the industry, you learn more about the spirits themselves. And, uh, you know, there's any number of wine tastings or craft beer events where there's a pretty girl pouring your drink and you ask her, oh, what's the mash bill or whatever, and <laughs> kind of gives you a blank look. And you're like, okay, never mind. I'll, I'll ask something <laughs> else. So uh, I really like having the educational component. And, you know, when people get it and, you know, friends and, and when people hear about it, they joke, it's like, oh, man, people must get hammered there. They don't. I, I have really never seen anyone what I would consider overly indulging because guests are coming 
They're paying either $95 or $195, and they're there for education, not for intoxication. You know, you can get loaded for 5 bucks, but uh, if you want to learn and, and appreciate it more, then, uh, you know, you're going to take care of yourself and pay attention. 5 bucks? you got to tell me where you're getting your booze Yeah, from. where's this? Well, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, talk again, you, you kind of mentioned some, some ticket prices right there. So, I guess uh, kind of talk about the tickets real quick because I want to jump back into um, some of the individual classes. Okay, so uh, Friday night, the VIP entrance is at 6.30, and VIP tickets are $195. That includes that hour early entrance. It's limited to 150 people, so uh, you're, you're not uh, competing uh, so much during that uh, time period. We have around 20 or 22 VIP pours. I know this year we'll have the Hibiki 21 year, and all Japanese whiskey is really hard to come by, so I'm excited uh, that we'll have that one. We're going to have the Snowflake from Stranahan's Distillery. So in some cases, there are things that are expensive. In some cases, there are things that are just very rare, limited edition, maybe not always available in Florida, and so forth. VIP guests also get priority registration for those classes, which we'll talk about in a minute. General admission uh, entrance is at 7.30. Uh, the whole event wraps up at 10.30. And with the VIP or general admission ticket, you get a little branded Glencairn glass when you walk in the door, and you can sample as much as your good judgment will let you sample in the time that you're there. Because I'm, I'm looking at it, it says unlimited tastings for over 200 spirits. Yeah, we're probably up to about 250. Oh, see? Now, now I think what you got to do next is you got to have like something that's like a passport thing. So you every every you have to go try every single one. And you get stamped, right? And then by the end, you have to crawl and make your way to go collect your T-shirt or something. <laughs> Somebody had a great idea that if we could create some kind of an app and have like live rating during the event, and you know, you go to a table and you could you know say, man, you know this uh, you know Woodford Reserve or this Michter's Bourbon or uh, Heaven Hill or Larceny or, you know, oh, man, this is my favorite. And if there's a way to have kind of this live scoring, that's a great idea. I do almost all this myself, and I'm not that technology-oriented. So uh, Roadmap for 2017. Yeah, and if there's a uh, if there's a huge whiskey fan tech nut out there, then uh, call me and we'll figure out how You're to do talking that. to one on the other line. <laughs> <laughs> well, the wheels are spinning. There, so... Uh, I, I was just going to say, so uh, uh, you get a little glass when you uh, walk in the door. You can sample as much as you want to. We've got wonderful food. Michael's on East is a fine dining restaurant with uh, great Zagat ratings, and uh, the food is excellent. We encourage people, obviously, you know, eat, drink water, take care of yourself during the event. Uh, we also have a companion ticket for $45. That includes wine and food. I don't call it a designated driver ticket because... Uh, wine is included. And, um, you know, those are for non-whiskey drinkers. And, you know, in some cases, they're just friends who want to come along and be a part of it. I, it's I come with we, an Uber pass, too. Well, we, uh, yeah, my motto is take your friends and Uber. <laughs> yeah. So, absolutely. And, and honestly, I have uh, uh, marked police cars at both entrances. So people see that when they come in and when they leave. And I've got a lot of staff and security around. Anyone who looks like they may be overindulging, we just want to talk to them and say, hey, make sure you're getting home safe and so forth. Because, you know, the whole industry is so focused on responsible consumption. You know, we don't want to have anyone get into trouble in any way. So we were talking about Michael's on East and the and the food and so forth. So, um, you know, the, there's a there are three ticket levels and the companion tickets. Uh, sometimes they seem to be some single women who maybe want to come out meeting some uh, whiskey fans. And uh, that's fine. There you go. It's It's a lot easier than going to the hotel bar, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to kind of talk about the classes a little bit more just because some of them look pretty interesting, right? So the first one that I kind of looked at that, that really caught my eye, and it's the first one, it's the history of North American whiskey, one sip at a time. And that's from Michael Ring, who's from Brown Foreman. Do you, do you know kind of anything that he's going to be talking about during that class? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Brown Foreman is one of my big sponsors. I've got a great relationship with them. They help out with other charity events that I'm involved with locally. You know, obviously they have some iconic whiskeys. Their distiller from Woodford, Chris Morris, is coming Thursday night to the panel. He also happens to be the chairman of the Kentucky Distillers Association right now. He does like two events a year. 
So it's a big deal that Chris Morris is coming, but he can't make it to Friday. So the local ambassador, uh, Michael Ring, is going to lead this class. And since Brown Foreman also uh, has the, you know, they own a Collingwood Canadian whiskey. So Michael's going to talk about Collingwood. The idea is, uh, you know, that, that company has been around for well over 100 years. I don't remember exactly when Jack Daniels himself founded the distillery, but something kind of 1870s, as I remember. You know, there's a long history there. And then the other one that I saw that was pretty interesting was the cigar and whiskey pairing. So I guess, is this something that, I mean, you guys going to be sitting there puffing smokes as you're sitting there drinking, drinking some whiskey or is, or how's that going to work? Yeah, absolutely. So the venue Michael's on East is a fantastic complex. It's got a, you know, restaurant, dining room will actually be in operation uh, that night. We take over the ballroom and then they have a wine cellar uh, on the other side of the property. So the wine cellar can be split in half. So we'll have classes going on uh, at 8 o'clock in there on each side. And then there's a patio area outside. And the cigar class is the most popular one every year. We have seats for about 35 people. And then another 20 probably stand around. And the first year, Alec Bradley was our cigar partner. The last two years, it's been uh, CNC Cigars with their Dram Cigar. And this year, uh, just to change it up, I've worked out an arrangement with uh, the Cigar Castle in Tampa, and the owner is coming down, and he is bringing Monte Cristo cigars, and Philip Pepperdine, the Beam Suntory ambassador, is bringing two whiskeys. And I kind of think that Beam Distiller's Masterpiece is one, and Bowmore Isla Darkest is the other. Going by memory there, so uh, it may not be 100%. But that's, that's a great class because you can— Smoke cigars outside, learn about these things. In, in the past, the cigar partner has brought slideshows of the tobacco fields down in Honduras and Dominican Republic in different places, and they get into the whole, you know, the nuts and bolts of the wrapper and the filling, and it really... I'm, I'm standing there for five minutes. I learned more about cigars than I ever have. Yeah, I got a personal question. What was it for a bourbon drinker? What is a good start for a good cigar pairing? Because I have no clue. I do enjoy cigars, but I don't have any clue what to pair with my bourbon. Well, that's a good question. The, the, the CNC cigars created a line of cigars specifically to go with different spirits. And they have a graphic that has like, uh, you know, light, medium, and bold. I would probably go with their medium, you know, because they're reasonably priced. They were designed to go in the whiskey world. You know, I would probably start there. Personally, when I smoke a cigar, it tends to be a lighter one because uh, I gave up cigarette smoking 20-some years ago in, in college. And uh, so I'll have an occasional cigar now. I found, like, if I have a really, like, one of those partagas black sun-grown ones, mm-hmm. yeah. it obliterates. I mean, I love it. It's a phenomenal. But it obliterates whatever you're drinking. And then on the other hand, if you have a really super light cigar, then, you know, what's in your glass is going to overwhelm it. And so, you know, just like any good whiskey, it's all about balance, right? Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. So the other kind of question that I have as we're, as we're going to wrap this up is that I'm looking at a, a lot of the list of all the different whiskeys that are going to be there. I mean, just reading off, I mean, you've got some of the ones that are pretty prominent that you'd see on the shelf, 1792, Benchmark, Buffalo Trace uh, in the whiskey world. You've got things like Corsair, Clyde Mays, Glen Mirage, you kind of said that, Heaven Hill, High West. Is there any kind of local distilleries around Florida that are going to be there that are going to be uh, partaking in this as well? There are. So uh, Palm Ridge is a distiller up kind of near the villages, and they've been going for a few years. Interesting operation. I've been up there. They were one of the first Florida whiskey distillers. It's got a great citrusy Florida character. Uh, That one's interesting. There's a new distillery in St. Pete. I think that they're going to be serving a cocktail at the event uh, rather than neat whiskey, but one of the most Interesting and exciting ones, one of my favorites, actually, is just north of Tampa from Spring Hill. It's called Wild Buck, and they make a rye. It's, it's remarkable. Just within the last few years, uh, they got up and running. They found a distributor. They're getting shelf space uh, at bars and restaurants as well as retail shops. It's pretty good. I've been to the St. Augustine Distillery. I was there this summer, 
and all their whiskey is still sleeping in the barrels and won't be ready yet for a while. So there's there's little bits and pieces, you know, that are starting to emerge down in Florida. But it's a real challenge. When when we were at Palm Ridge, they use small, uh, I think, 20-gallon barrels. He let a sample maybe four months in, six months, eight months, 12, 14, that kind of thing. With this climate and the barrel size he's using, at like eight to 10 months, it's really reaching kind of peak maturation. And when you get to 12 or 14 months, it's overcooked. Hmm, interesting. And it, it's remarkable how... Too much heat. Too much heat. I mean, you can... Well, and it's, it's not just too much heat, but up there, you know, it's a couple hours north of us. It's, it's getting closer to Gainesville. And, you know, it might be 60 degrees in the morning and 90 in the afternoon. So they're getting a lot of atmospheric changes during the day and a lot of interaction with the wood. So, uh, But it was fascinating because you can just really see in what a short period of time that barrel reaction, you know, what, what, it's, what it's doing. And, and you, can, you can see the color and you can taste the flavor, and it really is remarkable. Yeah, it's really good to know that there is some whiskey that's happening down in, in the Florida area because I think you had mentioned it before we start recording that at some point everybody moves to Florida. Right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Turner, I wanted to say, first, thank you for coming on the show and sharing your story and sharing this. But before we end, uh, I want you to plug your website and where everybody can buy tickets and, again, remind everybody when it's happening. Oh, great. Thanks. The Whiskey Obsession Festival is uh, three nights. It starts Wednesday, March 30th with a dance party. Uh, Thursday, March 31st is our interactive panel discussion where we have a flight of 16 whiskeys presented by distillers and ambassadors and then friday april 1st is the main event with 250 whiskeys available to sample plus the uh six classes that happen during the event all the information is on the website it's whiskeyobsessionfestival.com and if you hit the tickets tab up in the uh, middle of the bar in the top it'll take you to eventbrite and all the ticketing is online uh, my phone number is on there i organize about 99 percent of this myself and i'm happy to field any questions and phone calls from uh, people who need to know more about it. <laughs> well, again, uh, Turner, thank you for so much for being on the show. It was fantastic to kind of get a, an insight onto what's happening in the whiskey and bourbon world outside of Kentucky for once, right? Because we're definitely, uh, I guess you could say, biased or favored towards looking to a lot of this stuff, but we definitely appreciate you reaching out, wanting to come and talk about this on the show. And if you like what you hear, you can always subscribe to us on iTunes. You can Follow and like us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those awesome social media outlets. We try to post on there often and try to keep coming with uh, new content when we're not sitting there plugging out new episodes. Yeah, thanks again, Turner. Not that anyone needs a, another reason to go to Florida, but why not for Whiskey Obsession? That sounds like a great event, especially for us closed-minded bourbon people to broaden our horizons and branch out into the different uh, whiskey worlds. I think it'd be a cool event for listeners. Sarasota and Siesta Key, we vacation there all the time, and it's just a wonderful area. I'd highly recommend people to go to this event. It's beautiful. There's nowhere else in the state I would live. It's a great place. But, uh, you know, it, you come down, and you can just uh, reinforce your relationship with some of your favorite bourbons. Bernie Lovers will be here from Heaven Hill, and Pam Heilman from Michter's, and, uh, as I said, Chris, Wood, Chris Morris from Woodford. Bourbon is uh, it's popular for a reason. And, That's right. Uh, well, thank you again, and we'll see you all next time. <laughs>